Hi, it's Doug Holland LMT with another massage tip for massage professionals. Today, I'd like to give you a tip on how I make an assessment to find a subnormal muscle. The way I like to do that is to look at four categories. One is the agonist, the other is the antagonist, then we have the synergist muscle, and of course, the fixator. Now, why would we want to look at those? Because one of those muscles might be the root cause of the problem and not what the patient thinks is the primary issue. So just as a reminder, what is an agonist muscle? Well, we know that is the primary mover of the bone itself when under flexion. The antagonist, obviously, it works against that muscle to bring balance. Then we have the synergist. It works in harmony with those with, with the primary mover. And then we have the fixator, which fixates a certain area so that that primary uh, mover can work more efficiently. So those are the four categories I'm gonna be looking at to try to discover what muscle might also be a problem. So I'm gonna move here in just a second and we're gonna talk about the biceps brachii because I think it is the most phenomenal example because of all the attachments to the humerus that it has. So let's dive deeply into the biceps brachii and the associated muscles. Now we know the biceps brachii has two heads. It has a long head and it has a short head. Now the long head originates on the supraglenoid tubercle of the scapula and the short head originates on the coracoid process of the scapula. Both originate on the scapula and that's going to be really important when we start talking about fixators uh, down the line here. Now we know the insertion point is on the radial tuberosity of the radius and that allows it as an agonist to flex the arm and flex the forearm. Flex the arm and flex the forearm. The antagonist to that muscle would be the triceps brachii on the back, right? Because if this is flexing, this, this muscle here has to elongate. And if this muscle is now relaxing, this muscle back here, the triceps, have to shorten. So under concentric movement, which we consider uh, the, the flexion itself, the antagonist has to support that. And the eccentric movement, it slows it down because it has to support the primary mover. So that's the relationship between the agonist and the antagonist. Now, the synergist muscles uh, for the biceps brachii are this. You're going to have the, the brachialis, which is a short muscle. It only does one thing. It flexes the forearm, so it breaks at the elbow. It originates on the humerus and then inserts on, on the ulna. We also have the brachioradialis, originates on the humerus and then inserts on the styloid process here. Now it's more of, of a forearm movement, but it still breaks that forearm and, and helps in the relationship to breaking the elbow. That's what we're going to be concerned with. Now the coracobrachialis will help in flexing the arm, but we're not going to talk about that one right now. We're going to get to there when we start talking about fixators. But just as a reminder, when we're looking at the primary mover of the biceps brachii, it's the strongest muscle of, of the, the anterior arm. You got the brachialis and the brachioradialis that act as synergists or helpers uh, to the biceps brachii. Now we want to start thinking of fixators. What are we going to be thinking about? How many fixators do you think there are for just the biceps brachii? I had to write them all down. It took a while. <laughs> But if we, we think at first, uh, most of us are going to think of the deltoid, right? It, the deltoid originates on the spine of the scapula, the chromium on the, uh, on the scapula itself, and of course the, the, the lateral aspect of the clavicle. So it stabilizes the, this part of the scapula and the shoulder. And then it inserts on the deltoid tuberosity of the humerus. This is important because when I'm trying to do Let's say I'm trying to do a curl. Let me grab a bottle of water over here. Let's say I'm trying to do a bicep curl. Everybody's familiar with that, right? A bicep curl. If I don't have stabilization of this shoulder, as I bring this out, this arm is just going to fall over. 
the shoulder is going to roll, and the bicep is not going to be able to do the job in which it does. So it needs to be stabilized. So most of us just think, well, you know what? The deltoid is going to pin, you know, the anterior, posterior, and middle part of the deltoid is going to pin that, that, that scapula down, and it's going to hold it in place so that, that bicep's brachii can do its job. But that's not the only muscle that, that helps. How about the latissimus dorsi? It inserts on the intertubercular sulcus of the humerus. So when you're doing a bicep curl like this, that latissimus dorsi locks in on the back of the back, hooks onto the humerus, and helps stabilize that part of the humerus from moving. It's keeping it almost perfectly vertical. Then we can't forget about the teres major, right? That's its little cousin. It also uh, is inserts on the intertubercular sulcus, and it holds and stabilizes the humerus. We also have the pectoralis major. It also inserts on that intertubercular sulcus. So now we got the pec major, we got latissimus dorsi, and we got teres major. All three of those muscles are also pinning that bone down so it doesn't move. What other muscles can we think about? How about the pectoralis minor? See, the pectoralis minor attaches to the coracoid process of the scapula. So it can flex and it can pin the scapula so it doesn't move. How about the coracoid brachialis? It originates off of the coracoid process. So the pectoralis minor inserts the coracoid, uh, the coracoid brachialis. It originates off that. So it's going to pin it. Right, because it's only involved, the coracobrachialis is only involved in flexing the arm like this. It doesn't flex the forearm, just flexes the arm because it originates there and then inserts on two thirds of the humerus. But you think about that, you got two muscles right there, right off the coracobrachialis uh, or coracoid process that are pinning that part of the anterior aspect of the scapula. How about the sits muscles? You have supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor, and subscapularis. All four of those muscles attach to the greater and lesser tubercle of the humerus at the top of the shoulder. That's quite a few muscles that act as fixators just for the simple movement of a bicep curl. So what we're going to do, now that we know what our fixators, our synergists, our antagonists, and our agonist muscles all together, how they work together, what we're going to do now is we're going to discuss how we can make an assessment and find the real problem to what might be happening. So the example I decided to use, which is a common one that I find among athletes who train at the gym improperly, is an improper repetitive bicep curl. You would think this is something simple. It's something that would be taught since we were 12 or 15 when we picked up our first weight. But I cannot tell you how many athletes make a mistake in this simple movement. So what they'll come in with is biceps tendonitis. And they'll be blaming the biceps brachii for this. They will feel pain right in this area right here. I'm kind of looking at the camera, but they'll feel a pain right about in here. And what they don't realize, it's a failure of, of the brachialis itself because it's never being worked uh, to its fullest extent. So let me demonstrate. So I'm gonna turn sideways here. And what we'll see in the gym is somebody will curl, they'll have a curl bar, and they will come down with a curl bar and they'll bring it to here and they'll bring it to here and they'll bring it to here and then they will stop. If you look at my arm, is it fully lengthened? No, it's not. This is fully lengthened. The elbow now is locked out. If you come to here, it's not fully lengthened, right? There's still an angle to it. They will stop here. The, the resistance will end here, and they will overuse the antagonist, which is the tricep. It's the back muscle in the back of the, uh, of the arm here. They will use the antagonist to stop the motion here to take pressure off the biceps brachii. But if they were to bring the bar all the way to where it's in a relaxed state, 
Now they would have to use the brachialis, that short flexor. Its only responsibility is to flex the forearm. That's all it does. If they would allow it to come all the way down, they would allow this muscle to do its job, which would take pressure off the biceps brachii. It would also allow the antagonist muscle, the tricep, to completely and fully extend itself. So you'd have full extension and full extension on both sides. So now the brachialis to, means to break. It would break the forearm and bring it to this point. That would give just a tiny little bit of rest to the biceps brachii at the bottom of the movement. It would give it a tiny bit of rest. And then as the breaking happens, then the biceps brachii takes over, and then it comes all the way up, and then we see the bicep movement complete. And it's the same thing all the way down as, as the arms fall and fall and fall and fall. The antagonist is helping, and then all of a sudden, the brachialis takes over. Does that make sense? So just this little movement, you can find out through assessment, this is where the real problem is. They're not doing the exercise right. So as massage therapists, we have to get in there and we, this, this muscle is going to be hypotonic. This muscle back here is going to be uh, shortened. So it's going to be hypertonic. And then we're going to have uh, tendonitis that we're going to have to do cross fiber and circular friction on, on the biceps brachii at the point of insertion on the radius itself, right? So that's just an example of, of how you have to look at the antagonist, the agonist, and also the synergist. And I'm thinking, well, what, is there a fixator that could be a problem in that area? Could be, could be. I'd have to really think about it. But more than likely, we've got three of the four group that's truly being affected just in the breaking of the forearm. Well, I hope this helps. If you enjoyed this tip on how to make an assessment on a muscle that's not being used or, or subnormal in its activity, please hit like and subscribe. And just remember this, if there's no discomfort on the table, well, it's nothing more than a foo-foo massage. <laughs>